This online section is being presented to you by MS University out of Tempe, Arizona. It includes new material published in the National EMS Education Standards in 2009 in response to the EMS Education Agenda for the Future. My name is Wendy Younger. I'm a paramedic educator. I will be presenting this program for you, Section 13, Pathophysiology. These are your knowledge objectives. And Section 1 is the cellular environment. According to the body hierarchy, the cell is the single most important component. Cells form tissue, which forms organs, which form systems, which form the body. So a threat to the well-being of, of the cell threatens the body. The most basic element of emergency medicine is to keep the cells alive. And as a paramedic, every skill you provide is designed with that basic concept in mind. The cell is the smallest unit of life. It's made up of complex structures designed to protect and contain the inner contents so that they can perform their life functions. Cells perform the following functions. Movement, metabolic absorption, secretion, respiration, conductivity, as well as reproduction. Each cell is surrounded by a plasma or cytoplasmic membrane. This membrane separates the cell contents from interstitial fluid, which is a dilute salt solution. The plasma membrane encloses the cytoplasm, which is living matter, and forms the outer boundary. It's three ten millionths of an inch thick. There are two layers of a phosphate-containing fat lipids, which are phospholipids, that form a fluid framework around the cell. All of this is bound together with cholesterol. The plasma membrane appears very delicate, but it performs a number of vital functions. It allows a free passage to some materials, but it blocks others through certain proteins on the surface of the membrane. For example, certain hormones bind to the membrane receptors, and a change in cellular function follows. Surface proteins also serve as positive identifiers for each individual because they only appear on the cells for that person, as in tissue typing. And this is the plasma membrane. Now the cytoplasm is the internal living material of the cell. It lies between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. Inside the cytoplasm are multiple small structures and groups called organelles. The organelles are made up of smaller structures with very specific functions. They are ribosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, mitochondria, lysosomes, centrioles, cilia, flagella, the nucleus, nucleolus, chromatin, and chromosomes. Their functions follow. Now ribosomes are small particles that are found throughout the cell made up of subunits constructed mostly of RNA. Some of them are temporarily attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. They synthesize enzymes and protein compounds. The endoplasmic reticulum is a system of membranes that form a network of connecting sacs and canals that wind back and forth through the cytoplasm. The canals carry protein and other substances through the cell. The membranes themselves are either smooth or rough. The rough membranes receive and transport newly made proteins, and the smooth membranes manufacture new membrane. This is the endoplasmic particular. The Golgi apparatus consists of flattened sacs stacked on top of each other near the nucleus. The sacs break off the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and carry new proteins and other compounds to the Golgi apparatus. The sacs fuse with the Gol Golgi apparatus and it chemically processes the molecules. They break away from the Golgi apparatus, attach to the plasma membrane, then release those new materials into the bloodstream. That's what they look like. Within the mitochondria, energy-releasing chemical reactions occur all the time. The Krebs cycle, which produces ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, occurs within the mitochondria. ATP is the fuel for all the cells. This cellular respiration uses oxygen and glucose to produce the fuel. 
Each mitochondria has its own DNA molecule with the necessary information in it for the mitochondria to function. Lysosomes. Lysosomes are membranous walled organelles that look like little sacs also. They contain enzymes that digest food compounds, cellular debris, and other organic material. They can also digest microbes that attack cells, providing a degree of protection for the cell. Centrioles. Centrioles are paired organelles. Uh, two of these rod-shaped structures occur in each cell. They lie at right angles from each other. They play an important part in cell division. Cellia are extremely fine, hair-like extensions on the exposed surfaces of cells. Their purpose is to create and assist with movement of the cell. A flagellum is a single projection that extends from the cell surface. It's basically a tail. In humans, the only example of a flagella is the tail of a sperm. They're present on bacteria, specifically to assist with movement. This is an E. coli bacteria. Now, the nucleus controls every organelle in the cell. It also controls cell reproduction. It's surrounded by a nuclear envelope called the nucleoplasm. This is your nucleolus. This is located in the center of the nucleus. It programs the formation of ribosomes in the nucleus. The ribosomes then migrate through the nuclear envelope into the cytoplasm to produce protein. Chromatin and chromosomes. Chromatin granules in the nucleus are thread-like structures composed of protein and DNA. DNA is the genetic cookbook within the body that contains the code for both structural and functional proteins. DNA is what determines who you are. Your gender, metabolism, body build, hair color, everything. During cell division, DNA becomes tightly coiled into chromosomes. Each cell contains 46 different DNA molecules in its nucleus and one copy of the 47th molecule in each mitochondria. Here's both X and Y chromosomes and you can see the strand of DNA running down the center of them. The cells of the human body depend on their environment for survival. This environment consists of varying levels of fluids and solutes. The balance between these two is necessary for survival as well as adequate functioning. There's a lot of serious conditions that result from an inadequate balance in the internal environment, and if it's severe enough, the cell itself may die. Water can move pretty much without difficulty from the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid compartments and vice versa, depending upon the needs of the the, uh, the body. Each of the body's compartment is separated by a membrane. That membrane is selectively permeable, meaning it's selectively permeable to certain solutes as well as fluid. Now, osmosis is the movement of water, which is a solvent, across a semi-permeable membrane from an area of lower concentration, lower solute concentration, to an area of higher solute concentration to minimize the difference in the concentrations between the, the two, the, the membrane. The human body, okay, the solute consists of electrolytes such as sodium, potassium, and molecules like glucose. Water can generally move without much difficulty between the different compartments because the membranes that select the compartments are permeable to water. Selective permeability is accomplished through pores in the membrane that are selective on the basis of the size, shape, or electrical charge of the molecule. The body tries to maintain an equal solute concentration and, therefore, osmolality on each side of the membrane. 
when that kind of balance exists, it's isotonic. When an imbalance exists in the ionic concentration from one side of the membrane to the other, the side with the higher concentration is hypotonic, the side with the lower concentration is hypotonic. The difference in the concentration from one side to the other is called the osmotic gradient. The plasma membrane in all healthy cells separate the cell contents from the tissue fluid around it. On the same token, that cell membrane has to allow certain things to enter the cell and also to leave. The traffic in and out of that cell is constant. Water, food, gases, and waste form an endless procession. There are certain processes that allow this mass movement. The transport processes are considered passive or active transport. Active transport requires the expenditure of energy by the cell. Passive does not. Adenosine triphosphate is the energy source required for this active transport. ATP is produced in the mitochondria using energy created from glucose and oxygen. For active transport to occur, ATP is broken down and its, rele and its released energy is used. Easiest means of remembering the difference is that in all active transport processes, energy is required to move substances from a low concentration to a high concentration. In passive transport, no energy is, is needed to move substances from high concentration to low. The passive processes are diffusion, which includes osmosis, and filtration. Diffusion is defined as the spreading of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration, and that property applies to both solids and gases. By moving some of the solute from one side of the membrane to the other, the body reduces or eliminates that concentration gradient and creates balance. This is the body's natural tendency and it's referred to as moving with the concentration gradient. A complete elimination of concentration gradients is impossible because ions and molecules are always in motion in a random pattern. This means that concentration gradients come and go, but the natural tendency is to create equilibrium as much as possible and the net change is close to zero. This is how the body is able to move some nutrients and waste products in and out of the cell. With gases, the molecules are spread farther apart and the diffusion rate depends on the weight of the gas. The body is able to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide in lungs because of diff diffusion. Now, it's, it's sometimes necessary to move molecules uh, across a membrane that can't use diffusion or must move against that concentration gradient. In those situations, the movement occurs by active transport, and instead of diffusion, it uses facilitated diffusion. Diffusion itself is the process by which solutes spread themselves evenly throughout an available space. If there's a membrane between those solutes, the solutes are going to move into the area of lower solute concentration, and water will move into the area of higher solute concentration. If you take a glass of water and you put a drop of food coloring in it, consider those that drop of food coloring to be high in solute concentration. You go back and you look at that fluid about a minute later, and it is equally the same color. It's all, if it was red food coloring, the water then will be pink. And that's because those solutes spread out equally throughout that entire solution. This is kind of an uh, example of diffusion. It starts out very heavy on one side of the membrane. They begin to move through the membrane into the area of lower concentration. And then we have equality, equilibrium. Um, osmosis is the process of, of water movement, and that's just diffusion of water across the selectively permeable membrane when some of the solutes can't cross that membrane. 
What the water attempts to do, to do is dilute the solution down to where the sol solutes are equal on both sides of the membrane. Uh, filtration is also a, pa a passive process, and that's the movement of water and solutes through a membrane because of the greater pushing force on one side of the membrane, or greater hydrostatic pressure. Water and solutes will always filter out of the solution with the higher pressure into a solution with a lower pressure. Filtration is the process that's responsible for urine formation in the kidneys, and it's due to hydrostatic pressure. Now, the active transport processes are basically uphill movement of a substance through a living cell. Uphill refers to up a concentration gradient or basically against a concentration gradient. Energy of that movement is obtained through ATP. Active transport is used to move those substances against that concentration gradient toward the side of the higher concentration. It's similar to operating a car in, in that the car can roll down a hill without having any, uh, without requiring any energy to do so. But once it gets to that hill, now it has to be moving and it takes energy to move it up that hill. Facilitated diffusion is the movement of substances across a membrane by binding to a helper protein that's integrated into the cell wall and allows only certain substances to cross the membrane. Once it's bound to that protein, the resulting molecule changes shape and is allowed to pass through the membrane. After passing through the membrane, the original molecule is released. That's the mechanism that your body uses to transport glucose which is a large molecule into cells. It's similar to regular diffusion and then it works with the concentration gradient. Okay, it moves from a higher concentration to a lower concentration and it doesn't generally require energy. As with active transport, facilitated diffusion occurs more quickly than regular diffusion. Now an ion pump is a protein in the cell membrane pump carrier. The ion pump uses ATP to actively move ions across the membrane against that concentration gradient. They're very specific, and different ion pumps are required to move different materials. Sodium pumps only move sodium. Calcium pumps only move calcium. Some ion pumps are coupled so they can move two or more substances at one time. A good example of that is the sodium-potassium pump. The sodium-potassium pump pumps sodium out as it pumps sodium in. Because both of those substances are pumped against a concentration gradient, this creates a high concentration of sodium outside the cell and a high concentration of potassium inside the cell. When that pump is operating, it pumps three sodium ions out of the cell and two potassium ions into the cell in one cycle. ATP is broken down in the process so that the energy that's free can be used to move the ions. This is the sodium potassium pump. And this is facilitated diffusion. And this is active transport. There are primarily two kinds of metabolic processes that occur in the body. There's catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism occurs when molecules are broken down and energy is released. Anabolism occurs when larger molecules are formed by synthesizing smaller pieces, which release water. However, it also uses some of the ATP that's created during catabolism during that process. The body relies on a balance between those two processes. Okay, catabolism has to equal anabolism. 
In order to do that, the body has to create fuel for homeostasis. Oxygen can't be stored in the body, so the amount of oxygen that it's taken in has to meet the cellular demands of the body. When the amount of oxygen fails to meet the demand, the patient goes into shock. When glucose and oxygen go through the Krebs cycle, it normally yields 32-36 molecules of ATP, high energy electrons, and water. If no oxygen is available, anaerobic metabolism occurs, which only yields two molecules of ATP and pyruvic acid as a byproduct. That pyruvic acid degrades into lactic acid, which eventually can cause severe metabolic acidosis. One thing that you have to remember is that there's a, it takes a huge amount of ATP to run the sodium potassium pump on cells. In a shock state, that pump begins to fail, allowing sodium to enter the cell and potassium to leak out. Along with the sodium, large amounts of salt enter the cell. It causes the cell to begin to swell and deform. The cell eventually rises. Depending on the number of cells that are destroyed, all organ systems can be compromised. Cellular adaptations. Um, the ability of cells and tissue to adapt and change is actually essential for organisms to survive. Those changes can be from uh, a result of something that happens outside the environment or something inside the environment. The adaptation of the cell can occur to protect the cell itself from injury. Now changes in structure and function regularly occur throughout the uh, human body, including um, aging. A lot of those changes ch occur without the person's knowledge. Some of them can be quite obvious. Once the cell has undergone successful adaptation, meaning that it's changed and it actually has, has um, attained homeostasis with its environment, the function may be enhanced. But sometimes the adaptation may instead have the opposite effect. The cell may not function as it normally did. Whether it's occurred as the result of a pathologic process or an increased functional demand is sometimes difficult to tell. But cells do have the ability to adapt in order to meet the demands of the body or to adjust based on use, disuse, abuse, or disease. Okay? Atrophy is basically the shrinkage of cells, and it can occur for a number of reasons. The cause of it might be temporary, uh, as, in, as is the case with most cellular adaptations. The most common pathologic causes of atrophy include uh, conditions of um, like denervation of muscle tissue, diminished blood supply, or even nutritional deficiencies. It, it also can have physiologic causes, and those usually include a decreased workload or a change in the needs of the body. If a cell undergoes atrophy for, for one of these kinds of physiologic reasons, it's, it's an effort of the cell to realign the energy requirements of that cell to the function it's performing. The cells in muscle, for example, in an immobilized limb will shrink from a loss of intracellular protein. And although they, sh they shrink in size, they'll still be able to function, but probably not as forcefully or as well as they did originally. And once again, it might be temporary. Now, hypertrophy is an increase in the size of a cell, tissue, or organ. And that usually occurs in response to an increase in the workload or demand placed on a cell. In cells that can't divide, like skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle, the only way that they can meet that demand is to grow. That increased size is usually a temporary condition. The cells will revert back to their original size if the workload returns to normal or the causative factors removed. Now, dysplasia is a form of adaptation 
that's closely related to hyperplasia. It's sometimes referred to as atypical or abnormal hyperplasia. In that kind, this kind of adaptation, the cells take on abnormal size, shape, or organization as the result of ongoing irritation or inflammation. Sometimes this can be reversed if the causative factor is removed. This type of cellular adaptation is usually a cause for concern because most of the time it, it leads to a precancerous condition that can pro progress to a malignant formation. Hyperplasia is an increased number of cells due to increased cell division. As with atrophy, there are physiologic as well as pathological reasons for this to occur. They're generally part of normal growth and maturity of the human body, but the pathologic reasons are much worse. For example, uh, the growth of many tumors is a result of hyperplasia, and this can occur, occur throughout the entire body. The cancers might be benign or even malignant. Tissue that's been severely damaged is repaired by the body by patching the injury. This, can, this kind of thing can happen with liver regeneration. Patching is done with the formation of scar tissue. This is um, an enlarged prostate, prostatitis. You'll notice that there's cons a, a considerably larger amount of tissue than in the other one. Now, metaplasia is the transport, transformation of one type of mature cell into another type of mature cell. For example, cartilage can change into bone. Okay. Uh, pathologic reasons also exist, such as the change that occurs in the bronchial lining of long-term uh, smokers. The tissue lined with ciliated cells used to trap and remove foreign particles. Smoking causes that, and the cells transform into cells that can better withstand the toxins in cigarette smoke. Okay, that may sound like it's, it's uh, beneficial, but these changes cause a decrease in moisture and a reduction in the ability to clean the bronchial lining. That, in turn, can lead to infection and increased mucus production and that in turn can lead to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Also, uh, a lot of changes uh, like this is uh, basically pathologic. They're precancerous. Now, cellular injury occurs when the cells uh, is under assault. For the most part, cells are pretty much well prepared for the task, but occasionally they can be overwhelmed. Cellular injury occurs when a cell is negatively altered, damaged to the point that normal function suffers or it's permanently impaired. These are the most common causes of uh, cellular injury. Hypoxic, chemical, infectious, immunologic, and inflammatory, genetic, nutritional imbalances, and physical agents. Hypoxic injury is the most common cause and probably the most studied form of cellular injury. Uh, it can basically be categorized as irreversible or reversible. Okay. This also can be caused by a wide variety of events. Reduced oxygen in the air, a loss of hemoglobin or non-functional hemoglobin, a decrease in the number of red cells, uh, or a problem with the respiratory or cardiac system. The the problems that it presents for the cell are the same. The most common cause of hypoxia is a reduction in oxygenated blood. Reversible hypoxic injury is also referred to as ischemic injury. This kind of injury is reversible only if that hypoxic event is short. Uh, ischemic is insult usually results in several things that occur. Uh, impaired aerobic respiration. This occurs in the mitochondria, okay, where ATP is produced. Uh, anaerobic glycolysis. With a lack of oxygen, glucose can't be metabolized aerobically. This leads to a, a, a real decrease in ATP production, 
and an increase in uh, pyruvic acid. Decreased ATP. This occurs because of the lack of available oxygen. And increased lactic acid, also known as lactate. This is a byproduct of metabolism that builds up inside the cell. And that buildup occurs at a much faster rate during anaerobic metabolism. Um, ATP is required to maintain the cell wall. Okay, uh, It also helps with the active transport of electrolytes across the membrane. So a change in that production causes a lot of issues. The reduction in cell wall integrity makes keeping sodium out of the cell difficult. The, the, cellular, the, the sodium moves into the cell and it causes cellular swelling. The buildup of lactate inside the cell is a result of anaerobic metabolism increasing the amount of cellular swelling. If that cycle continues, the mitochondria become swollen, the cell will progress to irreversible damage. It is corrected, the cell may be able to return to normal functioning without any long-term effects. Irreversible damage occurs when that event lasts for a longer period. The exact point when that occurs is unknown. The buildup of lactate eventually breaks down the membrane of the lysosomes. Once it occurs, the uh, digestive enzymes are released inside the cell. That begins to destroy the organelles, the nucleus, the mitochondria, and even the, the, cell, the cellular cytoskeleton. Even if that cell is reoxygenated, the cell is too damaged to recover. As oxygen is reinduced into the cell, an additional sodium influx occurs, causing the cell destruction to continue. Chemical injuries, those occur when a toxic substance enters the body. All kinds of, of chemicals can cause uh, injury, alteration, death of cells, and ultimately death of the organism. These can include common things like alcohol, drugs, carbon monoxide, as well as environmental toxins, including uh, insecticides and, and herbicides. When that kind of injury occurs, the toxins create a biochemical reaction with either the plasma membrane of the cell or one of its organelles. After damaging the cell wall, sodium water and calcium pour into the cell uh, and the damage continues the same way as a hypoxic injury would occur. Infectious injuries. Virulence is a term used to refer to the relative pathogenicity of an infectious agent. The virulence of a bacteria, a virus, or other agent is determined by its ability to invade and destroy cells, to produce its toxins, or to produce hypersensitivity reactions. Bacteria, one of the oldest life forms on the planet, um, they don't really cause adverse effects or disease states in the human body. The, the majority of them don't. In, in the human body, as a matter of fact, bacterial cells outnumber humor, hum, human cells approximately 10 to 1. That kind of non-threatening bacteria is considered normal flora. Um, the biggest problem with uh, cells is the substances they produce that are harmful to the cells uh, and the tissues, and those are exotoxins and endotoxins and even exoenzymes. The exos exotoxins are proteins that are released during bacterial growth. Uh, they include enzymes that have very specific and sometimes systemic effects. Endotoxins are contained in the cell wall of certain gram-negative bacteria. They're generally released during the destruction of the bacteria by either the body's defense organisms or by treatment with medications. Endotoxins can also be released during the growth phase of that bacteria. Okay. If that occurs, treatment with medication will be ineffective on the endotoxin. Bacteria that release endotoxins are called pyrogenic bacteria because of the response fever that occurs after the release of those uh, endoto exotoxins. Exoenzymes are secreted by a number of microorganisms, including bacteria, during their normal life cycle. These enzymes cause destruction of tissue, uh, and they include mucinase, keratinase, collagenase, uh, coagulase, and the 
kinases. Streptokinase was one of the earlier thrombolytic medications that were developed from bacteria. The medications used to combat bacterial infections are, are antibiotics. They were once thought to be the answer to all infectious diseases. Okay, uh, that was quickly discovered not to be the case. Many other pathogens, including viruses, don't respond to antibiotic treatment. Antibiotics work on bacteria by destroying the cell wall, inhibiting pro protein synthesis, or by interfering with their reproduction. And this allows the body's defenses to digest and eliminate the bacteria. Because of the overuse and misuse of antibiotics, some bacteria have been able to evolve into antibi antibiotic-resistant strains. If the way antibiotics are prescribed or used is not revised, the number of drug-resistant bacterial strains is projected to increase exponentially. Once a large amount of those bac uh, bacteria and their toxins reach the bloodstream, the patient develops septicemia. It's characterized by vasodilation, hypotension, tis tissue hypoxia, and eventually cardiogenic shock. It's usually caused by gram-negative bacteria, but this always, isn't always the case. Okay, they, they have to figure, figure out what kind it is by uh, blood cultures and whatever. Viruses are the most common cause of infection in the human body. They're very good at causing infection. Okay, As a matter of fact, viruses can actually infect bacterial cells. They work differently from other pathogens. They survive and replicate by taking over the metabolic machinery of the host cell. They can avoid being detected and can bypass the body's defense systems because they hide inside normal cells and they don't produce endotoxins or exotoxins. Viruses can be really aggressive. They replicate quickly. They move from cell to cell to survive. In some instances, that can be a good thing. As it moves from cell to cell, the immune system develops defenses that eventually stop the virus. And so the infection itself can be self-limiting. But other aggressive viruses can, can cause severe and ir irreversible damage in short periods, and some can remain hidden or dormant for months up to years until they receive a trigger that causes them to start to replicate. These pathogens have a relationship with the host cell, and they don't cause immediate cellular death, because if they do, then they have to find another place to live. In some cases, the host immunity may be strong enough to limit how bad the outbreak is or prevent it altogether. Viral infections can result in the death of the host, the death of the virus as a result of the host defense mechanism, or a chronic carrier state. Viruses aren't structured like bacteria. They're smaller and lack the structures um, that they do. Um, these pathogens completely depend on the host cells for replication and survival. Uh, viral replication is composed of five steps, absorption, penetration, replication, maturation, and release. The method of absorption in the host cell is a function of the type of capsid that the patient, uh, or that the uh, virus has. Uh, what the capsid is, is it's, it's a uh, protein coat on the outside of the virus. Uh, viruses with a naked nucleocapsid bind to the host cell, and the nucleus, nucleic acid is absorbed into the cell without the virus itself entering the cell. Viruses some viruses bind the host cell by inserting spikes into the membrane of the host cell. It's then absorbed into the host cell, where it's uncoated, releasing the viral nucleic acid into the cell. And once it's done that, the virus begins to make multiple copies of itself. It prepares those copies for release so that they can infect other cells. In contrast, other viruses sometimes integrate their genetic material with that of a host cell and become a permanent residence. When that occurs, the virus replicates when the host cell uh, when the host cell replicates. 
there are very few mo uh, medications that can that can kill viruses. To eliminate a virus, a host cell has to be eliminated. Obviously, that can create a problem. Identifying cells that have been infected and targeted, and targeting uh, drugs to attack them, is almost impossible. In addition, the ability of viruses to mutate and mutate quickly uh, makes it almost impossible to come up with a antiviral medication that will that will combat that that very virus. Um, fungi, in addition to bacterial and viral infections, fungi can cause pathologic conditions. They're relatively large organisms, so they can either grow as single-celled yeast or multi-cell molds. They have thick cell walls that are really different from bacteria, and they're pretty much able to resist the typical treatments designed to disrupt cell wall integrity. They're generally parasitic in nature. They grow on or near the surface of the skin or in the mucous membranes. Parasites, they usually, uh, these are a plant or an animal that grows feeds and is sheltered on or in another, hand, uh, another plant or animal. It usually causes harm to the host. Endoparasites live inside the host. Roundworms, tapeworms, penworms um, include the helminths. Fungi such as ringworm are protists. Uh, which are protozoa, such as Giardia and Trichomonas. Ectoparasites live on, but not in their host. Examples would be like uh, fleas or ticks or, uh, and, and, and mites. Okay. An another type of thing that can cause an uh, infectious injury is a prion. This is a, um, an infectious agent composed only of protein. Known prion diseases affect the structure of the brain. Prion diseases are also known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. They include bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is mad cow, Kretzfeld Jacob disease, scrappy in sheep, and chronic wasting disease in doing up. Um, they don't know much about the prion diseases, okay? Uh, but most prions are composed only of protein, and they're very difficult to get rid of. Okay, the only way to do that was to denature the protein through heat, chemical, or other methods that would kill the infected host. We have immunologic or inflammatory injuries. Uh, the immune system is very complex. Okay, it's designed to protect the body, and because of that, it's sometimes dangerous. When cells come in direct contact with one of the cellular or chemical components of the immune system, they can be irreversibly damaged. Permanent damage with the cell would be uh, a, a destruction of the cell wall. Okay, whether that happens because of phagocytes like neutrophils or lymphocytes, uh, it could also be caused by histamine, antibodies, or lymphokines. Once cell wall integrity is, is, is compromised, the appropriate exchange of, of water and electrolytes is altered and the cell begins to break down. Injury due to genetic factors. These can be caused uh, from a defect that's passed from parent, from parent to child. It can also occur from uh, environmental factors or spontaneous mutation in genes. These defects can cause damage in the cell's nucleus and cell wall structure, shape, or even the receptors, because any any change you make to the structure of the cell can cause changes in the way that it operates. Sickle cell is a good example of a genetic uh, a, a genetic problem. Um, nutritional in, imbalances, either a, a deficit or an excessive amount of certain nutrients, can affect the, the function of cells. Um, all cells need proper amount of electrolytes to function, and those are acquired through diet. When this doesn't occur, there's a wide range of diseases that can happen. In the U.S., most of those diseases have been reduced or eliminated, but throughout the world, 
diseases like scurvy or rickets can be found. Uh, in, in contrast, um, an excessive amount of certain things can also cause cellular, uh, disease, uh, cellular damage. In the United States, <laughs> um, excessive caloric in, uh, carbohydrate intake leading to obesity causes injury. Um, physical agents can also cause cellular damage. Temperature extremes, prolonged exposure to extreme heat or cold, okay, burns to frostbite. Changes in atmospheric pressure, okay, there we're talking about possibly barotrauma or even altitude problems. Radiation, exposure to ionizing radiation, <clears throat> such as x-rays, can cause damage over a prolonged period of time. Other kinds, such as nuclear radiation, uh, can be real damaging in a very short period of time. Illumination, eye injuries associated with light, and also uh, types of skin cancer, and mechanical stresses. These can range from, uh, from traumatic injury to repetitive use injuries like um, um, carpal tunnel syndrome or overuse syndrome, or even, even hearing loss. Okay, this is the, this is the section on shock. All right, the first thing I, I want to talk to you about is the body's response in shock, and we'll talk about the types of shock. Adequate perfusion is pretty much equated to the movement of blood through the body in a sufficient amount to meet the physiologic needs of the body. The Fick principle describes the necessary elements to ensure perfusion, which are enough oxygen to load the blood, cardiac output adequate to move the hemoglobin, respiratory function adequate to move O2 onto the hemoglobin, and tissue receptivity to offloading of the oxygen. Um, regardless of the cause or type of shock, the common denominator is the amount of O2 consumed by the cells, or basically is required by the cell's metabolism. Okay, the body attempts to preserve, preserve vital function to pick, regardless of the cause. Okay. When the body is placed under stress, it will consume oxygen more rapidly, and, and compensatory mechanisms activated to restore that O2 and required perfusion. First, the body releases numerous neurotransmitters in response to the shock. Epinephrine increases electrical impulses, the rate, the contractile force of the heart, and increases musculoskeletal control. Norepinephrine causes peripheral vasoconstriction, which helps keep the blood pressure up and increases the contractile force. Angiotensin II promotes ADH secretion. ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone, ends up in the kidneys and it causes them to absorb water instead of release it. Aldosterone contributes to that by promoting salt and water retention in the kidneys. And cortisol increases blood glucose and suppresses the immune or inflammatory response. Renin that's released by the kidneys start that reaction that produces the angi angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction to increase preload. When you increase preload, you increase the afterload. It elevates the blood pressure and it causes the release of aldosterone. Okay, that's where the aldosterone goes to the kidneys and helps start, uh, it helps to start conserve, conserving fluid and salt. This can occur usually within about 20 minutes. Uh, the hypothalamus responds with the release of ADH from the pituitary gland, which goes to the kidneys again. It causes vasoconstriction and reabsorption of water in the kidneys, which increases cardiac preload. Those, all of these actions are designed specifically to increase blood pressure. Now, interstitial fluid shifts move fluid into the intravascular space. This causes an increase in vascular volume of up to one liter of fluid per hour. And last, the spleen uh, has microcirculation in it, which holds about two to 300 ml of blood, which is released into the circulatory system. During this stage of shock, the neurotransmitters are kind of 
um, attempted to support diffusion by increasing output by vasoconstricting crystal vessels to maintain organ diffusion and to provide the cells with the needed fuel to meet the challenge. Once the body has released the sympathetic nervous system neurotransmitters, the body has a limited time to respond as well as resolve the loss of circulating uh, oxygen carrying fluid. When the body's barrel receptors first detect that fallen pressure, the body's response initially is vasoconstriction. This occurs in the non vital organs first, the skin and the gastrointestinal tract. This leads to uh, an increase in peripheral vascular resistance that causes an increase in preload, cardiac output, and a small rise in blood pressure. Now, they may have a normal blood pressure, but their pulse rate, respiratory rate, and skin signs are going to reflect that they're compensating. The body is in compensated shock, but it's not going to remain there for long. The effects of those comp compensatory mechanisms begin to, to cause tissue ischemia which can lead to eventual organ damage and failure. And this stage of shock, if it's recognized and treated appropriately, can actually be reversed. Following that compensated stage is decompensated. As the compensatory mechanisms fail, metabolism is becoming more anaerobic and producing progressive acidosis and also less ATP. Okay, more neurotransmitters are released by the sympathetic nervous system causing profound vasoconstriction. Blood is trapped in the capillary beds causing modeling and cyanosis. Cardiac output begins to fall due to a decrease in preload, but there's also a further increase in weight. And as shock progresses, that cardiac rate will begin to fall. LOC is usually, usually altered, urine output decreased, or even absent. As this stage progresses into irreversible shock, the patient declines further with much more noticeable signs and symptoms. Uh, tachycardia leading to eventual bradycardia. Skin signs such as modeling, cyanosis, diaphoresis, uh, their skin temperature is cool to cold. Severe thirst, delayed cap refill, and falling blood pressure. The cell membranes lies metabolic acidosis increases, patient is usually unresponsive with a decreasing pulse rate and dysrhythmias, blood pressure is not detected, respirations may be agonal, the skin becomes dry. One thing we need to remember is although shock usually follows a, a pretty, uh, pretty specific pattern, that there are going to be um, there are going to be some variations in people's responses to shock. Okay. Determining factors can, in, can include age and relative health, older adults who are less able to compensate, children who compensate longer but they deteriorate faster, a patient's general physical condition, pre-existing disease, uh, the ability to activate their compensatory mechanisms, medications, some of which can interfere with compensatory mechanisms, and where exactly and what type of, of shock the patient has. A shock is, um, is classified according to cause. Now, more than a hundred types of shock, believe it or not, have been discussed in medical uh, literature. In emergency care, though, it's commonly classified based on the cause. And although those classifications are separate and distinct, two or more types are often combined. For example, hypovolemia can occur in septic shock, and elements of cardiogenic shock can occur in hypovolemic shock. Um, it can also be categorized, for example, cardiogenic, caused by the heart, hypovolemic, caused by the loss of volume, neurogenic, caused by damage to the nervous system, anaphylactic, caused by an allergen, and septic shock, caused by an infection. In recent years, the terms describing the types of shock have occasionally taken different forms related more toward mechanisms. For example, cardiogenic, heart failure, hypovolemic, loss of volume, 
obstructive, which is mechanical obstruction to the preload, dissociative, inability of hemoglobin to bind with the release oxygen, and distributive, distributive, which is massive vasodilation. Okay? Um, and we're going to go ahead and, and just run through these one at a time and talk about um, uh, some of the variations between each particular type. Okay? So cardiogenic is caused by the heart's inability to provide adequate circulation to maintain metabolic processes. Uh, this type of shock is commonly caused by damage to the heart muscle, okay, particularly the left ventricle um, from an acute MI or some other insult which causes a drop in cardiac output. Damaged or dead cardiac muscle doesn't contract with the same force as healthy tissue. So this reduces blood flow to the body, including the heart itself. Uh, it becomes uh, it becomes a kind of a, a positive feedback loop as the body tries to compensate for it, and what it does is it just worsens the situation. Even though the body interprets and responds as if the problem is one of volume, the issue is not volume. It's the fact that the heart can't pump enough blood. Uh, as the blood flow drops, the heart tries to compensate by increasing the rate and the force of contraction. This increases O2 demand and further worsens the damage. Uh, when that occurs, the output drops even farther. Now, hypovolemic shock uh, is usually the result of approximately 25 to 30 percent of the intravascular fluid volume. Again, it's classified the same way in either classification system. Intravascular volume loss can occur from a lot of different things, but the most common cause is from blood loss, either internally or externally, um, as a result of trauma. Other causes are plasma loss from extensive burns. Medical causes, like extreme dehydration or fluid shifts from intravascular space to interstitial. The body tries to compensate, but it may have little success. A loss of only 15% of intravascular volume can produce the initial symptoms of shock. Rapid pulse, uh, pale kind of scan, dizziness, nausea, and thirst. Neurogenic shock. This causes relative hypovolemia, okay, because of the loss of nervous, nervous control over the blood vessels. This is usually a result of a traumatic injury to the brain or the spinal cord. The loss of nervous control over the vessels causes the prostate to dilate, increasing the capacity of the system, and creating a state in which proportionally less volume is present, but without volume loss. Blood pools in the extremities and reduces the amount returning to the heart. This usually causes some of the signs and symptoms of hypervolemic shock, but the body may not have the capacity to compensate because of structures related to the sympathetic nervous system that might be affected by the trauma. So decompensation can occur at, at really an accelerated rate because those compensatory me mechanisms that constrict vessels, release the ca uh, catecholamines, or increase the heart rate and stroke volume are basically lost because of the injury. Anaphylactic shock. Extreme allergic reaction when the body responds to an allergen and the immune system responds to defend the body against the effects of the invader. In a majority of cases, this goes unnoticed by the affected person. The body is constantly sampling the internal environment and responding to change. In other cases, the response can, can, can produce signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction. In the most extreme cases, that progresses to anaphylaxis. This kind of reaction can be caused by a lot of different agents. Um, food, shellfish, um, envenomations, etc. But anaphylactic reactions are systemic and they affect all organ systems. The, the effect of these reactions on the cardiovascular system is vasodilation. Anaphylactic shock occurs when hypertension is caused by this vasodilation. Okay, in addition to the standard signs and symptoms of shock, they may have urticaria and constriction of the airway. And they can be severe with an acute onset and an extremely rapid progression. 
although rare, anaphylaxis can occur without associated signs and symptoms other than cardiovascular collapse. And if it's not treated immediately, they will die very quickly. The precursor to septic shock is an infection in the bloodstream. Um, the infection travels throughout the body and spreads to the tissue. As it continues to develop, toxins are released by the substance causing the infection. Additional toxins are released from dying gram-negative bacteria. Eventually, this leads to the body's inability to fend off the infection, and that's when they begin to show systemic signs and symptoms. This is the most common cause of multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. The signs and symptoms may not be obvious until the infection is very well seated. This means that once it's identified, the progression of the illness can happen quickly. Patients may present differently depending upon the organ system involved. Multiple organ dysfunction syndrome is progressive impairment of two or more organ systems. It's usually caused by uncontrolled inflammatory responses after severe illness or injury. As uh, such as sepsis, trauma, or severe burn injuries, the most common cause of this syndrome uh, is sepsis or septic shock. The severe compl complication of MODS makes it the leading cause of death in patients admitted to intensive care units in the U.S. It's estimated, okay, to be associated with a mortality rate of 60 to 90 percent. Um, the, the pattern of deterioration in MODS uh, was initially was initially identified in 1975, and it was called at one point in time uh, multi-system organ failure. It was later renamed MODS in the early 1990s. The um, the pathophysiology of it is uh, poorly understood, okay, but it's believed to be the result of the adaptive processes at the cellular level in response to injury or insult. When the body's damaged, part of the response is inflammation. Okay, according to one theory, severe injury or illness produces an inflammatory response that's unable to localize the problem, and systemic inflammation occurs. The most prevalent theory is that a cascade of events occurs, leading to systemic inflammation and the deterioration of organ function. Regardless of the true cause and the advances that they've made in diagnosing it, the mortality rate over the last 20 years hasn't gone up. It can be a primary condition, okay, the organ injury is directly related to a specific in, uh, insult causing ischemia and hyperperfusion, or secondary condition as a result of this inflammatory response. In, in primary mods, the injury or infection leads to both a stress and an inflammatory response. Okay, this response is, is usually not that severe and may go unnoticed in the clinical setting. Okay, in the body, macrophages, neutrophils, and mast cells are thought to be primed or made ready to respond to the uh, next insult by cytokines. The next insult usually comes in the form of more ischemia or infection, and this sets off a chain of events that leads to secondary mods. Secondary mods, the body releases the inflammatory mediators. They cause a, a dis, disproportionate reaction to that secondary insult. The mediators or the endotoxins that are released from bacteria cause damage to the vascular endothelial. Mediators such as cytokine tumor necrosis factor stimulate this pro-inflammatory state uh, when it begins interacting with the damaged vascular endothelium. It causes an adhesion of neutrophils. These neutrophils work their way into the tissue, causing more inflammation. This causes the permeability that permits fluids to leak from the vascular system into the interstitial spaces. Increased permeability, uh, along with the effects of nitrous oxide release, which is a potent vasodilator from the cells, can lead to profound hypertension and hyperperfusion. And in response to that, 
the neuroendocrine system is activated. It tries to compensate by releasing catecholamines into the circulation. But the body's not able to compensate at that point. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, those factors only contribute to a worsening of their condition by causing the patient to become tachycardic, uh, go into a hypermetabolic state, which they're not able to compensate for, and increase O2 demands. Now, some of the hormones that are released in the stress response, such as endorphins, only increase the state of hyperperfusion by reducing vascular resistance even more. The inflammatory mediators released cause the activation of certain plasma protein cascades. Uh, the the complement coagulation and and calicrine kinin systems. These when that the complement system is released or, or affected, it causes a release of chemicals that increase further the level of neutrophil aggregation and promotes the release of histamine from mast cells. Both of those cause further dilation and hyperperfusion. Coag factors become activated um, as a result of that endothelial damage, and because the damage is extensive, these form microemboli that form blockages on the microcirculation of organ ligaments, which further causes uh, ischemia in those organs. One of the hallmarks of NODS is ineffective vascular function. Vasodilation, increased permeability, all these little microthrombi, and selective vasoconstriction all lead to the end result of this condition, and that is that multiple organs begin to fail and begin to die. That selective vascular vasoconstriction is caused by the interaction between two chemicals with opposing vascular effects that become distributed inappropriately throughout various parts of the body. And that leads to this, this uh, kind of spotty distribution of uh, systemic blood flow and organ perfusions. Other things that go along with the systemic problems include hypermetabol a hypermetabolic state, which the body can't respond to, an imbalance in oxygen demand and supply, and tissue hypoxia, that causes cellular changes that lead to organ dysfunction and death. All these changes contribute to this hypermetabolic state that leads to a more rapid depletion of oxygen supply, a reduction in ATP, and without that supply of ATP, the cells, the tissue, and the organs of the body just can't perform the necessary tasks to stay alive. Okay, before we continue on and we talk about lab tests, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, management and treatment for a patient in shock. You, your management and treatment plan for a patient in shock really focuses first on assessment. You have to assess their um, oxygenation and confusion of body systems, and the goals of your treatment plan are going to are going to be to ensure they have a good airway to provide adequate oxygenation, ventilation. To hopefully restore perfusion and to rapidly transport uh, to get the patient to definitive care. The initial assessment can help identify whether self perfusion is adequate. Okay. Um, first of all, airway. Airway has to be open, patency must be maintained. Breathing. Respiratory patterns often reflect how adequate their ventilations are. For example, if they're acidotic, rate and depth of ventilation is going to be fast in an attempt to reduce carbon dioxide content. Assess the patient's circulatory system. Okay, check them for obviously any uncontrollable bleeding. Pressure dressings can be applied to control hemorrhage. Um, now, nowadays it is direct pressure and then go directly to tourniquets. Uh, in, in, should, you should suspect internal bleeding in any patient with signs of shock, um, especially trauma patients without evidence of external blood loss. Rapid transport is critical. Evaluate the rate, character, and location of the patient's pulses. 
they increase very early in shock. The increase helps to maintain their, their uh, blood pressure and cardiac output. Um, but, but, but those attempts to maintain cardiac output may be negated by the decrease in preload. Tachycardia usually won't occur until the patient has suffered a 10 to 15 percent volume depletion as a result of blood loss, or as an or, or as a uh, or in response to an increase in container size. Character of the pulse can be strong or weak. The strength of the pulse provides an estimate of the filling volume of the artery being palpated and an indirect measurement of systolic pressure. Tissue perfusion can sometimes be estimated by evaluating color, moisture, and temperature of the skin. Now, these can be unreliable, obviously, in patients who have, who have been uh, exposed to the environment. Uh, they can also be in, in unreliable in patients who have septicemia or shock caused by neurological injury. An evaluation of fingers and toes, which are the most distant points of circulation, is really critical. These areas can be the first to show inadequate tissue perfusion. If ambient temperature is good, tissue perfusion is adequate, those areas will be going to decay. Cap refill test can offer some useful details on pediatric patients. Uh, you, you, just, you can only use those as a guide. Um, accuracy of that can be affected by the environment, the patient's general health and age and gender. Evaluate the patient's LOC. They can become restless, agitated, and confused um, as cerebral ischemia develops. In addition to shock, of course, they can have cerebral edema and intracranial bleeding from head injury. Any significant change in their behavior or responses should be considered an indicator of a, of a critical perfusion deficit. Okay, and this is true whether the decrease in cerebral circulation is from shock or from an increase in, in intracranial pressure. Um, you should expose the patient. A visual inspection can reveal conditions that may be life threatening. And obviously they can be hidden by clothing. Now Generally, we just assume that shock is hypovolemic unless we can prove it otherwise. There are some things you can look for um, that, that will help you differentiate between hypovolemic shock and other causes of shock. For example, in cardiogenic shock, they often have a chief complaint of chest pain, dyspnea, or extreme heart rates, uh, okay? uh, tachycardia, bradycardia, or, or other dysrhythmia. Some patients also show signs of congestive heart failure like jugular vein distension, and then of course there's their history. Okay. Uh, if you have a patient that's sitting in a recliner, you know, hypervolemic shock caused by trauma is kind of not possible. Distributive shock, which would be neurogenic, uh, anaphylactic, receptive. Patient's history or situation may be um, the, the biggest reveal that suggests vasodilation is the cause. Signs and symptoms are unusual in the presence of hypervolemic shock, include warm, flush skin, especially in dependent areas. Uh, patients uh, who have neurogenic shock sometimes have a normal pulse rate. Obstructive shock. This is caused by the obstruction of blood flow. These patients are often the victims of major chest injuries, including penetrating type injuries, or they reveal a history that's consistent with PE. Patients with cardiac tamponade or tension pneumo often have jugular vein distension. Um, also, patients with chest trauma have the mechanism for that, and they may be missing breath sounds. Once you once you have done the the initial stuff. You need to do pretty much a detailed, um, a detailed secondary survey. A assessment should begin with, with baseline vital signs and evaluating the EKG. You should expect the pulse rate to increase above normal limits after a period deficit of 10 to 15 percent. Some patients, though, continue to have a normal pulse rate even though they have that kind of volume deficit. Bradycardia, which can be caused by hypoxemia, an existing neurological injury, increased vagal tone, pre-existing illnesses, or prior meds 
can also indicate severe myocardial ischemia, which is your primary cause for cardiogenic shock. Brady rhythms often occur just before cardiac arrest. When you note a Brady rhythm, optimize that patient's oxygenation by increasing what they're getting or by assisting ventilations if needed. The diastolic blood pressure first arises okay, in patients in shock as peripheral vascular resistance increases. Those changes decrease the container size. Okay. Blood's also shunted away selectively from certain portions of the blood. When the heart can no longer pump blood to keep the container full on the arterial side, the diastolic pressure begins to drop. You should expect that when blood loss is greater than 20 to 20 percent, 20 to 25 percent of normal circulating volume. The systolic pressure falls when the heart can no longer pump enough blood to fill the container at the end of that contraction. Systolic pressure is usually more sensitive to volume depletion than diastolic pressure. So the systolic pressure usually drops first. But as that fluid deficit approaches 25%, both of them, systolic as well as diastolic, begin to drop. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that uh, evaluating orthostatic vital signs in conscious patients who you suspect it a shock it was probably not a good idea. Um, however, if you do that, if you take a patient from a recumbent position to a sitting or standing position, uh, a fall in systolic pressure of 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury with a rise in pulse rate after one minute of 10 to 15 beats a minute indicates a at least 10 percent volume depletion. Um, a fluid deficit can still even exist after the systolic pressure returns to normal following fluid replacement. So fluid replacement initiated pre-hospital should continue uh, until you get them into the hospital. Okay. Resuscitation of, of shock patients. Um, number one, first and foremost, is adequate oxygen. Normally the, the uh, the formula for oxygen in a patient is a um, enough oxygen to maintain an SpO2 of between 94 and 95 percent. Okay, um, that depends on your protocols. Okay, another thing is fluid. Okay, the second component. Okay, necessary to maintain ad adequate oxygen carrying capacity requires the patient's container to be full of fluid. You can basically achieve that by decreasing the size of the container. And that's especially the case in shock that may not be associated with hemorrhage. Okay, some cases of distributive shock, vasoconstricting drug, can be used to manage the shock when the reduction of the container size is the main concern. Okay, they may also need volume replacement. Now, vasoconstricting drugs are not recommended to treat patients in hypervolemic shock until fluid volume replacement is complete. And complete volume replacement very rarely occurs in the pre-hospital setting. Uh, another thing might possibly be the use of the pneumatic kind of shock timer. Now. They're very controversial. You may not find them out there. You may still find them out there. Okay? Um, but the focus on MAST has moved from using them to help maintain a blood pressure in a shocky patient to two particular instances, and that is bilateral lower extremity fractures and pelvic fractures. Okay? What they used to think about mass trousers, or I'm sorry, the pneumatic kind of shock timer, was that the vessel, uh, that the pants would reduce vessel diameter and artificially increase peripheral vascular resistance in the tissue beneath the confines of the suit, uh, which may or may not be true. Um, it can arrest hemorrhage 
by by tamponading any bloody, bloody vessels, okay, within the abdomen, pelvis, or lower extremities. But it will contribute to more rapid bleeding for any injuries outside the confines of the, of the trousers. It can help stabilize pelvic and lower extremity fractures when it's inflated. It pads circumferentially and decreases movement and causes less blood loss. The decision to use them is left to local protocol and medical direction. The, the one absolute contraindication for not using them is pulmonary edema. Uh, relative contraindications are injuries outside the confines of pants, uh, hemorrhage within the chest cavity, uh, a patient that, that has rising intracranial pressure. Um, some medical direction authorities feel that the use of mast is also contraindicated for any impaled object in the, in the abdomen. They say that you can still use them, but just don't inflate anything over that uh, impaled object. Uh, if there's an evisceration, you don't inflate the trousers over that. And pregnant females. Now, we're talking about advanced pregnancy, third trimester pregnancy. So, once again, the, the absolute contraindication is pulmonary edema. They do really work well on bilateral lower extremity fractures. Okay, because sometimes those fractures have, uh, there's no continuity in the bone. It's very difficult to uh, board splint them or uh, secure them. And uh, if, if the damage or injuries are really extensive, it's also difficult to control the bleeding. So once again, uh, you may or may not have these within your service, uh, but they have been used or on EMS ambulances for many, many years. Uh, there are some complications. Uh, sustained inflation of the, the garment for more than one or two area, uh, hours can lead to compartment syndromes, which can cause ischemia. Fluid resuscitation. Almost every shock patient, except for patients in cardiogenic shock, require some sort of volume expanders as part of resuscitation. The selection of IV fluid for initial volume replacement varies according to the medical director. Normal saline or lactated numbers. Now, um, there are also uh, oxygen carrying uh, fluids now uh, that are being used in some services for resuscitation. This should not be done on scene. If you have a critical patient, it needs to be done on the way to the hospital. The fluids that are used most commonly now are, are uh, crystalloid. They're created by dissolving crystals such as salt and sugar in water, and they don't have as much osmotic pressure as colloids. They equilibrate really quickly between the vascular and extravascular spaces. Two-thirds of that fluid that you give a patient leaves the vascular space within an hour. So three mLs of a crystalloid solution is needed to replace one mL of blood. LR really is the solution of choice for resuscitation, resuscitating patients in shock. It's well based, uh, well balanced, and contains many of the chemicals found in human blood. The LR contains sodium chloride, small amounts of potassium and calcium, and 28 milli equivalents of lactate, which acts as a buffer to neutralize acidity when it's met metabolized by the liver. One third of the infused solution will stay in the vascular space after one hour. Normal saline is basically the same thing. Although it's preferred by some physicians, the higher chloride content of normal saline is less desirable than the more balanced LR solution. As in LR, nearly one third of it stays in the uh, vascular space after one hour. It makes it equally effective as a volume expander. Studies really haven't shown superior uh, it, it's shown superiority of one option over the other. Now, 
glucose containing solutions have immediate volume expansion effects, but the glucose leaves the intravascular compartment rapidly with a resultant free water increase. The volume replacement benefits only last about 5 to 10 minutes while the glucose is metabolized. So that the use of 5% dextrose in water as a volume replacement is inappropriate. Colloids we don't use in, in the field. Colloids are, are large molecule proteins and they, they exhibit osmotic pressure. They remain within the vascular compartment for a considerable period of time. But unfortunately they are difficult to, to difficult to store, difficult to use, and some types of colloids uh, make it very difficult to type and cross blood for the patients who need uh, transfusions. The key principles in, in managing shock are to establish, maintain, and open airway, administer high flow to assist ventilations if needed, control external bleeding, by order of met control or per protocol, initiate IV fluid replacement if appropriate. Remember that administration of fluids in the pre-hospital setting should not delay patient transport because crystalloid solutions can't restore the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. The patient really is, is best served by rapid assessment, uh, airway management, immobilization, and rapid transport. Maintain the patient's normal body temperature, um, keep him in a supine position, don't use the Trindellenberg or the shock position, they're not using those anymore. Uh, in the absence of head or spinal injury, or if hypovolemia is suspected and ventilation is adequate, um, make sure you have the patient comfortable and covered. Monitor your cardiac rhythm, frequently reassess vital signs of mouth to the emergency room, and get them there quick. In terms of the five basic kinds of shock, okay, there are just a, a few little guidelines okay, for each one of those classifications. So, hypervolemic shock is not considered complete until that volume is replaced and the cause or the causes of shock are corrected. That is fluid replacement, volume replacement, I'm sorry, fluid replacement in cases of simple dehydration or volume replacement because of hemorrhage, definitive surgery, critical care support, and post-op rehabilitation. Cardiogenic shock, it focuses on improving the pumping action of the heart and managing cardiac irregularities. Initiate fluid resuscitation. Uh, it should be initiated as long as they have no crackle in their lung field. If, there, if, if you want to, give them a little um, fluid bolus, 100 to 200 mLs. If they improve, fluid therapy should continue cautiously. The patient should be kept in a form of permissive hypovolemia. Uh, it's easier on the body. Okay. You should be given fluid uh, to maintain a systolic blood pressure of around 90 or 100. Assess lung sound often. If they show signs of increased lung congestion, adjust the rate of infusion just to keep your vein open. Drug therapy for cardiogenic shock varies according to the cause. It can include vasopressors, vasopilators, inotropic drugs, and eye disturbance. Patient with, patients with cardiogenic shock caused by myocardial ischemia or infarction require reperfusion strategies, including you know, clot busting drugs or surgery or stents or whatever, and possible circulatory support. Neurogenic shock. Uh, similar to the management for hypervolemia, but you have to take care of doing, doing uh, fluid therapy to avoid overload. Constantly monitor the patient's lung sounds, closely for signs of pulmonary congestion. In addition, patients in neurogenic shock may respond to the administration of vasopressors, for example, dopamine. Anaphylaxis. Sub-Q administration of epi is the treatment of choice in acute anaphylactic reaction. 
depending on the severity of the treatment, might be oral IV or IM administration of antihistamine such as Nebula. Uh, you may also use bronchodilators to treat bronchospasm and steroids to reduce the inflammatory response. Crystalloid volume, volume replacement could also be indicated. Septic shock. Management of septic shock can include the management of hypovolemia and correction of metabolic acid base imbalances. Depending upon the patient's response to the infection, pre hospital care might involve fluid resuscitation, respiratory support, and the administrators, uh, administration of those pressures to improve their output. Uh, probably not, but okay. If possible, get a good thorough patient history. Um, that might help you identify the cause of it. Uh, any his, any immunocompromised group of patients have, has an increased risk of septic shock. Those could be patients with HIV, some cancer patients, patients who have inflowing urinary or vascular catheters. Basically, the integration of your patient assessment and treatment is that patients with severe hemorrhage or shock, uh, you have to have rep recognition of the event, treatment, prevention of additional insult, and rapid transport. Follow your protocols. This next section is on lab values. This, these are part of the new curriculum, uh, and we're going to go through go through these sort of one at a time. These are common lab tests. Laboratory values. Lab tests are significant indicators of a patient condition. Okay, a number of lab tests have predetermined panic or critical values to alert healthcare professionals about potentially life-threatening findings. Tests have many categories based on what's being tested and what results are needed. The categories include hematology, chemistry, serology, pathology, biology, microbiology, etc., etc. Uh, there are thousands of these tests out there, and I can't possibly address each one of, you, of them, okay? And it's not within the scope of this pro program to train you in specific lab exams, but to point out how these particular exams can assist in diagnosing specific critical conditions. The CBC, this is the most common hematological testing. CBCs measure hemoglobin, hematocrit. So with that, white cell, red cell counts, etc. Uh, hemoglobin, this measures the amount in whole blood. Whole blood. Normal in men, it's 13 to 18 grams per deciliter, and in women, 12 to 16. If the hemoglobin tends to be high, uh, you see that in smokers who have polycythemia. Uh, it's also low in patients who are anemic, who've had blood loss, or they're overhydrated. Hematocrit is the percentage of red blood cells in plasma. In men, it tends to run between 37 and 49 percent. In women, just a little bit lower, 36 to 46 percent. It's high in dehydration and high in patients who have polycythemia. It's low in patients who are overhydrated or anemic or who have suffered blood loss. White blood cell count gives you an idea of whether or not a patient has an active infection. Uh, the norms are between 4,500 and 11,000 per millimeter, per millimeter cubed. It's high in infection, patients who are using steroids or taking steroids, high in patients who have leukemia. It's low in viral infection, and patients who have uh, suppressed immune systems. Now, coag tests. Coagulation tests um, identify patients who have clotting and bleeding disorders and allow for adjustments in critical care situations. Coag tests include the study of prothrombin time, which is PT, which is factor 2 in the clotting cascade, 
partial thromboplastin time, which is PPT, which is used to detect coagulation disorders and co uh, coagulation cascade, cascade, and also to monitor peptin levels, and the international normalized ratio, which compares the prothrombin time to a pre-established control. The PT time, the prothrombin time, is 11.2 to 13.2 seconds. Uh, if it's high, the patient may have a history of cirrhosis, low potassium levels, or disseminating, disseminated intravascular coagulation. If it's low, it's not significant. The treatment for an elevated prothrombin time is to administer vitamin K and withhold anticoagulants. The PTT, which is the partial thromboplastin time, normal is 22.1 to 34.1 seconds. If it's high, the patient is on heparin therapy or has hemophilia maybe. If it's low, it's not significant. The, the treatment is to decrease heparin administration or administer protamine, which is given to reverse the effects of heparin. Protamine does that by binding to it, so it can't do its job. Renal function tests. Um, because renal function play, plays a large part in electrolyte balances, renal function is often included in uh, electrolyte chemistry tests. The components of the renal function assay are the BUN and creatinine. BUN is the blood urea nitrogen. Urea is a waste product from the metabolism of protein. An elevated BUN indicates renal disease or failure. And creatinine is a waste product from skeletal muscle and a good indicator of renal function. The normal BUN is 8 to 25 milligrams per deciliter. If it's high, uh, it could be renal disease or damage, dehydration or shock, congestive heart failure, GI bleeding, or patients who are, who are on high protein diets. If it's low, it could be from overhydration or increased ADH secretion. Creatinine, um, for men, it's 0.6 to 1.4 milligrams per deciliter, and in women, 0.6 to 1.1 milligrams per deciliter. If it's high, it might indicate kidney disease or a patient who's been taking medication that affect their kidneys. Low could be low muscle mass or muscle, uh, muscle atrophy. Electrolytes. Um, although there's generally eight electrolyte assays done when you're testing for electrolytes, this is only going to cover six. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the um, electrolyte imbalances. Okay. The first one is sodium. Sodium is, is the primary extracellular cation. Its normal concentration levels range from 135 to 145 milliequivalents. Primary functions are regulation of water levels, primarily in the extracellular fluid, and the transmission of nervous impulses. Sodium levels are, are regulated in the body by the kidneys. While sodium must be retained, aldosterone is released from the kidneys, and ADH is released from the posterior pituitary gland. Both substances cause the kidneys to retain sodium. If sodium has to be excreted, the release of these hormones is, is suppressed. High hypernitremia is dehydration, excess saline administration, exchange, transfusion with stored blood, and impaired renal function. This is a serum level above 145 mL put equivalents to liter, and it's caused either by the gain of sodium in the excess of water or the loss of water in excess of sodium. Uh, the last one is usually referred to as hypernitremic dehydration, which is the more common cause of hypernitremia. Hypernitremia is almost never found in an alert patient who has an intact thirst mechanism and access to water. The signs and symptoms are primarily seen in the nervous system and usually include irritability, tremors, uh, lethargy, delirium, seizures, and coma. 
If the cause is an excess loss of water, the patient may also have signs of, of dehydration, including polydipsia, tachycardia, dry, sticky mucous membranes, poor skin further, flat neck veins, and oliguria or anguria. Treatment for patient in the pre-hospital setting is, is primarily supported. Hyponatremia is a, a serum sodium level below 135 milliequivalents per liter, and it has a number of causes. Most common is the retention of water resulting in low sodium concentrations. It can also be caused by the loss of sodium alone or the loss of sodium in excess of water, referred to as hyponatremic dehydration. The signs and symptoms once again are seen in the nervous system, and those include lethargy, apathy, confusion, headache, and seizures. Other signs might include um, muscle cramps, tachycardia, nausea and vomiting. And because it causes cerebral edema, signs and symptoms of uh, increased intracranial pressure might be present. Potassium. Uh, potassium is the chief the chief intracellular power ion. It has many functions in the body, including the maintenance of fluid and pH balance outside the cells, normal neurological function, cardiac function, muscle contraction, and the storage of glycogen in the liver and skeletal muscle. It accomplishes some of those functions by ensuring that a resting membrane potential exists so that cells can be polarized. Nearly 98% of the body's potassium is intracellular. So there's generally an intravascular level of about 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. High is hyperkalemia. It can be caused by renal failure, excessive potassium replacement, severe tissue damage, and metabolic acidosis. Low is hypokalemia. Uh, excess diuretics that are not potassium sparing, inadequate intake, steroids, and metabolic alkalosis. Hyperkalemia is a state where the body has an abnormally elevated potassium level. Most common cause is the failure of the body to eliminate potassium at the proper rate. It can be caused by acute or chronic renal failure, which is the most common cause. Uh, urinary obstruction, burns, crush injuries, severe infection, and acidosis. There's also certain medications that can cause that. For example, digitalis basic blockers, beta blockers, and succedicolin. Not all hyperkalemic states occur as a result of an increase in total body potassium. Some simply stimulate the redistribution of potassium from inside the cells to the vessels. The signs of it uh, are, are primarily uh, neurological and also cardiac induction. The most common size sign is vague muscle weakness leading to flaccid paralysis which is a late sign other signs are tetany generalized fatigue nausea diarrhea cardiac signs and symptoms uh, dysrhythmias like bradycardia and the development of these tall peak t waves widening of the qrs complex and flattening of the t waves hypokalemia is a state where the level of potassium falls below that 3.5 uh, 3.5 milliequivalents per liter. And, and even though you, you get these electrolytes through diet, hypokalemia from a dietary deficiency is rare. The more common causes are insulin administration, prolonged episodes of vomiting, renal disease, uh, once again diuretics that are not potassium sparing, and alkalosis. Most common cause of hypokalemia is the use of diuretics. Most patients who are prescribed one of those are also put on potassium supplements. The signs and symptoms of hypokalemia is muscle weakness, hyporeflexia, and cardiac dysrhythmias. Chloride. Chloride, the normal, the, the normal ranges are 100 to 108 milliequivalents per milliliter. High is hyperchloremia, and that's from increased sodium intake, decreased bicarbonate level, renal failure. 
Low is hypochloridia, can be caused by vomiting, diarrhea, diuretics, and GI losses. Bicarbonate. The normal, the normal ranges for bicarbonate okay, are 24 to 30 milliequivalents per milliliter. High is considered base excess metabolic alkalosis, can be caused by uh, GI losses and diuretic use. Low base deficit metabolic acidosis, which is excessive bicarbonate intake or loss of bicarbonate or an increase in serum chloride. Magnesium. Normal ranges for magnesium are 1.4 to 1.9 milliequivalents per ml. Magnesium is used in the body in approximately 300 different chemical reactions, including helping the body absorb and use other electrolytes. It provides a supportive role in muscle and neurologic function, and it's important in the function of the heart. Okay, in fact, the relaxation of cardiac muscle depends on a consistent level of magnesium. It helps the body regulate blood glucose level, plays a role in protein synthesis. Um, approximately 50% of magnesium is stored in muscle and bone, with about 30% found inside cells. A very small percentage of it is, is found in the blood. Hypermagnesemia is a state where the body has an abnormally, but an abnormally high concentration of magnesium in the blood. It's a fairly rare condition, um, and it's usually associated with a reduction in renal function or a significant increase in dietary intake. There are certain medications that can increase serum magnesium levels. The signs and symptoms include nausea and vomiting, muscle weakness, alteration, um, altered, an altered mental status, bradycardia, and hypertension. For extreme cases, the only definitive treatment option is hemodialysis. Hypomagnesemia is a state where the body has abnormally low serum concentrations. It may be caused by uh, excessive gastrointestinal losses, excessive renal losses, including those that are caused by diuretics, alcoholism, malnutrition, and certain chronic disease states such as diabetes. The signs and symptoms of, of a low magnesium level mimic those of hypocalcemia. They may include depression, confusion, hyporeflexia, muscle weakness, and seizures. Calcium. The normal ranges for calcium in the, in the body are 4.3 to 5.3 milliequivalents per ml. The body uses calcium for a number of purposes. It plays a role in the stability of the cell membrane and permeability, hormone secretion, contraction of muscles, and the transmission of nerve impulses. It's also needed for several chemical reactions in a clotting cascade. Most of the calcium in the human body is located and stored in the bones. As the body's demand for calcium increases, it's released from the bone into the bloodstream. When it's released, half of it is bound to albumin, and it's not used for most of the function normally associated with calcium. The other half is free calcium, and it's available for use. Calcium often has an inverse relationship to phosphate. So if, if you have an elevation of calcium in the body, it triggers a drop in the level of, of phosphate in the body and, uh, you know, and vice versa. Hypercalcemia, um, it's a state where the body has an abnormally high level of calcium. It can be caused by a false rise in dehydration, caused by dehydration, malignant tumors, hyperparathyroidism, vitamin D overdose, Diazog diuretics, lengthy immobilization. Hyperparathyroidism is the most common cause because parathyroid hormone is essential for calcium to be released into the circulation. It can also be caused by tumors, some of which cause 
an elevated uh, parathyroid hormone release, cancers that affect the bone, excessive administration of vitamin D, or diuretics. The body uses vitamin D to stimulate the release of that uh, parathyroid hormone, and some patients receive vitamin D in the treatment of osteoporosis. Signs and symptoms are sometimes very vague. They may include fatigue, weakness, lethargy, nausea, renal stones, and behavioral changes. A hypocalcemia can be caused by hypoparathyroidism, renal disease, pancreatitis, malnutrition, or blood transfusions. The, parath uh, the parathyroid hormone is essential for that calcium to be released from the bone. It also activates vitamin D in the kidneys to promote reabsorption of calcium. This means that renal failure can also cause decreased calcium levels. The amount of circulating albumin is also important in maintaining calcium levels. If the levels falls, calcium also decreases. Body always tries to keep the level of bound calcium and ionized calcium in proportion. Uh, another cause of hypercalcemia is sepsis. If the patient is receiving large amounts of banked bloods, the calcium level may drop as a result of increased citrate levels. Citrate is used to prevent coagulation uh, in, in blood that comes from the blood bank by binding calcium. Signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia include nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, numbness and tingling sensations around the mouth or in the fingers and toes, muscle cramps uh, that may actually uh, progress to carpopedal spasm, abdominal pain, weakness, headaches, behavioral changes, and seizures. Arterial blood gases. The components for arterial blood gases are pH, PCO2, PO2, HCO3, SAO2, and hemoglobin. Um, if you're like any other paramedic and you, you follow a cardiac arrest into the emergency room, the first thing that you want to see when that first set of ABGs comes back is you want to look at that pH. And the reason you want to look at that pH is so you know what kind of chance that patient has of surviving that arrest scenario. Okay? pH is the concentration of hydrogen ion in arterial blood. PCO2 is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. PO2 is the partial pressure of oxygen dissolved in the serum. 99% of it is transported by hemoglobin. HCO3 is bicarbonate, which is your metabolic buffer. SAO2 is the percentage of hemoglobin saturated with oxygen. And HGD is the arterial hemoglobin reading. The, the normal range for pH in the body is 7.35 to 7.45. The human ranges for viability are 6.9 to 7.8. If the reading is high, above 7.45, the patient is alkalotic, which is uncommon. If it's below 7.35, the patient is acidotic. Of the two, the acidosis is actually easier to treat. The PCO2 is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood. 35 to 45 millimeters, millimeters per whatever that is. Uh, it's high, then they're in respiratory acidosis, probably from hyperventilation. Hyperventilation can be caused by respiratory depression. It can also be caused by uh, perfusion mismatching. Or, or shunting that's going on in the lungs. Low would be respiratory alkalosis or hyperventilation. PO2, that's the partial pressure of oxygen dissolved in the serum, 99%, which is transported by hemoglobin. Normal is 80 to 100 millimeters. High is overoxygenation or hyperventilation. Low would be hypoventilation 
or hypoxia. High carb. High carb is a metabolic buffer. Normal is 20, 24 to 30 milliequivalents per ml. Uh, if, the, if the patient has a high bicarb level, there's base excess. They could also be in metabolic acid alkalosis. Or they've taken excessive bicarbonate, as in antacids or something like that. If it's low, it's a base deficit. The patient's in metabolic acidosis, and they, they have a decreased chloride level for one of the cause. SAO2, that's the percentage of hemoglobin that's saturated with oxygen. Um, normal is between 95 and 100 percent, depending upon the, the patient's physical condition and also altitude. Normal, once again, 95 to 100 percent. If it's high, it's not really significant, but if it's low, uh, there's a good chance they're hypoxic or hypoventilating. And HGB is the arterial hemoglobin reading. Normal is 12 to 18 grams per deciliter. If it's high, the patient may be dehydrated or they may possibly have polycythemia. If it's low, they might be anemic or overhydrated or suffering from blood loss. That concludes the section on pathophysiology.